this is my DIY CNC mill. I built it out of a mini mill I bought a few months ago, and it is so awesome. I ended up deciding to make it purely because I was looking at DROs online and had the thought, wow, these things are expensive. I bet I can make a CNC mill for around the same price. Unsurprisingly, this wound up being a much more involved build than expected, so let's jump back to when I was having my first thoughts about how to make this thing. Okay, so what do we need to do to make this thing into a CNC mill? Theoretically, it's not actually that complicated. We take the milling machine that we already have and strap motors to the hand wheels. But unfortunately, we live in the real world, and in the real world, we have to deal with a little gremlin called backlash. Now, backlash is caused by the clearance between the internal and external threads of a lead screw assembly. This clearance means that every time you switch rotation direction of the lead screw, there's a dead zone that you need to travel through before you're able to move the thing that you're trying to move. Wait, this isn't the right demo. Ah, there we go. So as you can see, whenever we switch direction, the lead screw threads need to pass through this clearance gap before they engage with the nut. And that is what we know as backlash. Now backlash isn't actually that big of a deal on manual machines. It's kind of like the popular kids at school who weren't openly mean to you, but would always laugh at you when you're walking by after English class in third period, even though you're just walking to class like everyone else. <clears throat> and that you can compensate for it by being clever and adjusting your path. But for CNC's more complicated toolpaths, it becomes a major issue. So we're going to have to convert our driving axes to ball screws. And with this reasoning in mind, we're going to have to redesign the mini mill to accommodate the larger ball screw hardware. And we're also going to need to come up with some kind of mounting bracket to connect the motors we're going to need to the ball screws. So then let's hop over into CAD and get something designed. Okay, after a few hours in the CAD model, here's a plan. We're going to try to use these standard ball screw supports as the base for our motor mounts to hopefully save us a little bit of time and stop us from needing to machine any bearing interference fits. To connect the motors to those, we have two main designs to work off of. There are two instances of this style of bracket that adapts the standard bearing blocks, one for the X and one for the Z. Then there's this plate here, which is slightly unique to prevent interference with the X travel. As for the connections of the ball nuts themselves, we more or less are just replacing the existing lead screw hardware with ball screw hardware. We need to do some trimming of the ball screw flanges to do that, but overall it shouldn't be too difficult to get everything to fit. And lastly, the addition of the Z-axis, which previously didn't have a lead screw, but now will. I'm not totally sold on the rigidity of the solution I came up with here, but I think it should be a good starting point that we can upgrade later down the line. And with that explained, let's go get some metal and get building. To make this easier to manufacture, I designed it to use as much flat plate as possible. One big upside to this is that it lets us use templates to cut out parts, which is a fantastic technique for making things quickly. One big downside to this is that it means a whole lot of bandsaw work in the future. And don't get me wrong, the bandsaw is way better than using a hacksaw to do all this, but it makes a huge mess every time I use it, which I personally find quite annoying to deal with. Plus, after cutting, the edges and faces need to be cleaned up. Speaking of which, I've got a fly cutter on order, but it hasn't arrived yet. Luckily, we have a four-jaw chuck now, which lets me do one of my favorite tricks with a lathe. Okay, granted, it's not really a trick, but there's something very satisfying to me about using a lathe to make non-round parts. It feels like it's breaking some kind of rule. X, Z, and Y plates are smoothed up, and I've successfully stalled long enough for the fly cutters to arrive, so we can get started on the Z bracket. This is my first shot at using a fly cutter, and wow, these things are awesome. Look at that surface finish. So we have the main shape of our Z-axis bracket cut out, despite some minor technical difficulties. But as I'm sure you can see, we're far from having all the features cut. The main difficulty being this hole right here. I don't have a boring bar for the mill, and I don't think it's a safe idea to put this thing in the lathe. Fortunately, I have this super cheap rotary table I was going to make a video about. Though, in all honesty, I was pretty skeptical about how well it was actually going to work. But. Trying it out, I am pleased to report that it ended up going extremely well. Honestly, way better than it has any right to, considering how much it cost. I got tired of turning the hand wheel pretty quick though, and found a trick with the chuck key to make that go a whole lot better. Next is a bunch of repetitive milling, drilling, and tapping for all the parts we just cut out. 
Not gonna lie, it gets pretty boring pretty fast, so I think I'll just give you a taste of it and skip to the next build section. As a bit of a fun fact, I somehow ended up with over 250 individual clips of milling and drilling different parts, and I honestly have no idea how I managed to generate that much useless content. All right, that took a little bit longer than I wanted it to, but fortunately, we're now done making all of our custom parts. No, we're not. We still need to make the standoffs. What am I talking about? Oh, psych, you thought we were done? Nope, there's still a bunch more machining to do. On the bright side, all the machining's done on the lathe, which honestly I think is becoming my favorite tool. Okay, now we're done making all of our fully custom parts. I'll tell you what though, making 12 of almost the exact same thing on the lathe gets me thinking about another project that I need to take on. So we have a bit of a good news, bad news situation going on here. The good news is we've made a lot of progress making some of these parts. The bad news is we've reached a point where I can no longer avoid dealing with modifying these ball screws. In order to get these to fit, we're gonna to need to cut down the flanges, but to do that, we're gonna to have to take the ball nut off of the ball screw, and if we aren't careful, all of the ball bearings inside this thing are gonna fall out and ruin our day. I 3D printed this little tube thing to thread the nut onto to hopefully prevent that from happening, but we'll see if that actually works. Here goes nothing. Well, despite our best efforts, we lost a couple ball bearings, and I can't believe I didn't. <laughs> oh, that was completely my fault. Holes. Well, at least it's kind of interesting that we can see the inside of it now. I'll save you the trouble of watching me rebuild it and skip straight to the milling. Okay, be honest. How many of you folks were screaming at your computer telling me that this thing is hardened and I wasn't going to be able to machine it? I guess that means we're going to be switching over to abrasives. Which, unfortunately, also means... This is hurting me probably a lot more than it hurts you. Now, I'll openly admit that abrasive cutting tools are by far my least favorite tools to use. But you really can't argue that they have style. So our ball screws and ball nuts are cut down to size, and that means all of our parts are done. Next step is to disassemble and modify the mill. This wound up being a lot more straightforward than I'd expected. The mill really is put together like a giant metal Lego kit. It's almost like they want you to do this kind of stuff. Most of the modifications we need to make to the machine itself are all pretty straightforward drilling and tapping operations. My biggest concerns were caused later on by having to freehand drill the mounting holes in the column and head. I don't have a great track record for drilling and tapping straight without mechanical assistance, but I think everything worked out okay in this case. And after filing away some of the casting to create clearance for the x-axis ball screw, it was time to stop making and start assembling. I wish I wasn't as surprised as I was, but the assembly process went suspiciously well. It is not typical for me that all the parts I make fit together perfectly on the first try. Though, granted, the x and y axes were designed to be as close to a drag and drop solution as I could possibly manage. Now, that is not to say that everything went exactly according to plan. Moving on to the Z-axis, the assembly was still going great, but after I got the brackets installed and went to drop in ball screw,
Look, let's just keep this one a secret between you and me, okay? Honestly, it feels so great to see this thing come together. It might just be me getting too into this project, but I think it looks so slick. Now, as for electronics, I only have three things to say. One, I'm using FluidNC as my control firmware. Two, yes, I know these are open loop steppers and they should be closed loop. I'm waiting until I'm sure everything is working as intended before switching over to more expensive hardware. And C, wiring things up and writing config files is super boring, even for me. So why don't we just skip to when this is done? Sound good? All right. All right, after all of that electrical stuff you didn't have to watch, it's time for our first test of the CNC mill. Okay, nothing happening. Let's figure out why that is. That was extremely disappointing. Not gonna lie to you folks, I was really hoping this would work on the first shot. I tried to debug this for a while and could not figure out why it wouldn't move. I checked continuity, I confirmed the GPIO pins were correct, I made sure we were getting voltage when it was expected, and I was running out of electrical debugging tricks when a very unpleasant thought occurred to me. So I had originally bought the motors and motor drivers in a kit, and that kit came with this CNC control board. Now I'm obviously not using this control board, I'm using an ESP32, but I forgot to check whether or not the motor drivers work with 3.3 volt control logic which could mean that all of the work that we've done up until this point has been a complete waste of time. I was extremely worried while looking into the spec sheet for the motor drivers, but I was happy to find that the minimum logic value was within the range that we needed. And luckily, this is when I noticed something really important that I somehow managed to miss. Wait, no way it's something that obvious. All right, folks, it's moment of truth. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, yes, that's amazing. Oh. <laughs> I was very worried that we were in trouble for a bit there. Okay, uh, Y axis. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I finished up the wiring and ran a motion test where I discovered that there was some backlash in the table. I'm not completely sure, but I think that some of this is caused by these terrible motor couplings. So, I've ordered some new ones, but while we wait for that, I think we should throw on some weight covers and try out some power feed manual milling. I know this is nowhere close to the full potential of this thing, but it is already so much better than turning the wheels by hand. And through the power of movie magic, we're at the point where the couplings have arrived and are installed. Replacing these couplings did help. Unfortunately though, I'm still seeing about 4th out of backlash, and I think that just comes down to the cheap import ball screws that I'm using. This is obviously not ideal, but I think it's well within the limit of what we can tolerate, and it's a problem I could solve later by just throwing more money at it. So then, I think it's about time we see what this baby can do. And so, without further ado, I present the DIY CNC mill in all of its glory. You know, it's kind of funny, I spent all this time making a CNC mill, and now that I have one, I have no idea what I'm going to make with it. All I can think of is how nice it would have been to have this thing for making all of the CNC mill parts. I ended up opting to make some meaningless test geometry, and I feel like it's about time to sit back and enjoy the chips. This little test piece came out really well. The square section turned out about two thousandths under size, but it did turn out square, and that definitely means it's acceptable in my shop. There is a small flat spot on the interpolated circle section that I think is caused by that backlash that we found, so we'll definitely address that at some point. But honestly, I'm so happy with how this machine turned out. 
It is really cool to finally have a CNC mill, and I cannot wait to come up with all the projects that it unlocks. But we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. As always, thank you folks for watching, and I'll see you next time.